sooner. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about a project that we started back in 2013 when we were interested to see if we could quantify river hand runs in small tributaries of the Hudson, uh, and then also to see if we could identify any parameters that might be influencing uh, when we see those fish and how many fish we see uh, in those river areas. So a little background, you're probably all really familiar by this point. Uh, river herring is a collective term that's referring to two species, uh, alewives and blueback. Uh, they're anadromous, spending most of their uh, adult lives at sea, only returning to their natal uh, rivers uh, to spawn in the spring. Uh, <clears throat> we see them return for the first time to spawn between ages three to six. They're batch spawners, uh, mainly <coughs> can spawn up to two to three times uh, during a spawning uh, run. In the Hudson, we typically see ally spotting in the tributaries, but they'll also use the shallow shoals of the main stem. Uh, but blue backs prefer to the, the swifter, deeper waters of the main stem and the larger uh, tributaries. So a little bit of why we decided to, to do this study in the first place. Uh, we have a, or we conduct a rather robust fisheries independent sampling uh, survey in the main stem, where we use a 300 foot haul seine, um, and we sample four days a week for the entirety of the, of the run. Um, but we didn't know what was, if that was capturing uh, the trends that we're seeing in abundance in the main stem were uh, represented in the tributaries. So we needed a better understanding what was happening in the tributaries. So we heard of electronic fish counters, and they were commonly used at fishways. Right? So it's, it's pretty easy to incorporate one into the design of a fishway or retrofit one to a fishway if fish are already congregated. Um, but we don't have any fishways in the, in the Hudson, in any of the tributaries. So it wasn't until a colleague and, and myself were at a meeting with a bunch of other river herring biologists and uh, some folks from Massachusetts and Connecticut started talking about this in-stream application uh, of a, a fish counter. So that was our challenge except to hold my beer moment. And uh, we were very naive um, when we uh, accepted this challenge. We thought that we'd be able to go to the uh, creek two to three times a week for maintenance. Uh, we were completely wrong. So our study objectives were to see if we could, uh, a fish counting device was an appropriate method for us to um, collect river herring run uh, estimates in small tributaries of the Hudson and then also identify those parameters that might be influenced by migration. So the study area that we chose is Black Creek. Um, Black Creek is located in the town there in the Sofus, New York, at River Kilometer 135. It has a watershed of 22,000 acres. It's heavily forested. We have approximately 2.3 kilometers um, of habitat, spawning habitat, to the first impassable barrier, which is a natural set of falls. Uh, up until a couple of years ago, there was an old dam that was thought to be uh, a barrier to migration, but we've since found, um, observed river herring spawning well above that. Uh, we, and we chose Black Creek for two main reasons. It had a known river herring run, and it was close to the opposite. <laughs> Um, so a little bit about our methods. Uh, so we, in the, we use a streamline uh, weir with an electronic fish counter. The counter that we use is a, a Smith Route 160 or SR1601. It's a multi-channel fish counter. And we fitted it with an underwater camera to verify the accuracy of our counts. Um, as I said, I was very naive in how often we'd have to come and do site visits. We actually have to come six to seven days a week, and we usually come twice a day. Uh, we had we've had very different or several different kind of configurations and. Um, different materials that we've used for the weir. This is the actual, the first design. Um, it was made out of plastic mesh netting and lots of rebar. Uh, as you can see in the top here, we have a lot of leaf debris on the forest floor. So when we get high wind events or, or heavy rains that ends up in the creek, it, gets, it builds up on the weir and ends up with failure of the weir. Um, so a few years ago, we uh, contacted a company out in California named Fish Bio that they designed, the, or they built this weir for us. It's a rigid weir. It's made out of uh, half-inch metal conduit with half-inch picket spacing. This allowed for us to, uh, to, to maintain or clean, clean the weir uh, much more efficiently. We could do, clean this weir in about 20 minutes. The other designs took about two to three hours. Um, so the way that this works, it's, it's pretty simple. The fish, the weir forces the fish to pass through our counting tubes. We have eight uh, counting tubes. Each counting tube is fitted with three anodes. Um, once they pass through that, they go past our camera here, um, so that way we can go back and verify the accuracy of our counts. Um, 
This here just shows uh, we incorporated into our design the ability to lay the weir flat on the stream bottom during high flow events. In past designs, we actually had to remove the whole weir uh, and then rebuild it every time we got high rain events. So that, that, this was very helpful. Um, something to, to mention here too is the, the, the counter is not without limitations. It can't differentiate between fish species. It can't differentiate between a fish and a piece of debris that happens to flow through. Um, it's, it's a pretty simple technology. It, it measures water conductivity continuously. Uh, and then when a fish actually passes through one of those tubes, it changes the water conductivity and records it down. So we take a little closer look. These are the actual tubes. You can see it displays. to put videos and presentations because this always happens. No, it's playing on here, but not over there. Oh well. So all this was illustrating. I actually just put the <coughs> video footage from my phone because I was checking to see if there's any debris in the tubes. And this was some footage during the day. Um, where we had some, I just happened to catch some fish passing through, through the tubes. another video that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually some footage from the actual camera that we were using to verify our counts. And, oh, uh, this was we're good. Nice. <laughs> so, this is actually uh, some footage of when we had our highest observed rate of passage. This was in 2016. So over a 12 hour period, we averaged 3,700 uh, herring per, per hour. So it was uh, as you can see, when we go back to review this footage, it can be very time consuming. We usually have to uh, slow this video footage down uh, quite a bit. So we haven't been able to analyze as much of this video as we uh, we would like, we've, but we've been able to spot check some. Uh, and we're at this point, we're pretty comfortable with the accuracy of our counts. Uh, so to kind of put that <coughs> in perspective, we, have, we usually collect over 1,400 hours a video per season. Um, even there is software out there that can reduce that number, but it's still, uh, it's still a pretty big lift to get through all that footage. So a little bit about our results. Uh, ever since we've been uh, doing this uh, monitoring in, in Black Creek, we've only ever observed alewives. This was kind of surprising me. Based on historic sampling, they, there's been documented bluebacks in the system. Um, but based on our sampling and any mortalities that we've collected, we've not ever observed any bluebacks. It's been all alewives. Our counts have ranged from a minimum of just under 206,000 in 2013 to uh, over 655,000 in 2014. Um, and we have a mean, an annual mean of just over 376,000. Um, this graph here uh, shows in the, the, the gray bars our, our counts, and this dashed line is our geometric mean from our fisheries independent sampling. So, the whole, one of the questions we're trying to, to answer is if our fisheries independent sampling the main stem following the same trends um, representative of what's happening in the tributaries. And for Black Creek, this appears to be the case. So we have a pretty strong uh, correlation between uh, the, the, the trend of abundance to uh, the Nars the Pierce Nard value 274. So next, we wanted to look and see if there's any uh, environmental conditions that might be influencing uh, the, how many fish we're seeing and when we're seeing them. So we did that by using generalized additive models. Uh, we evaluated 11 um, abiotic variables, and these are the top three uh, models out of the 16 possible uh, models. Uh, and we got 52, a little, little almost 53 percent of the deviance explained in our data, which isn't great, but it's not bad. Either. We can do better. So we look at a little closer at the, the, the variables that appear to be most influencing when we see herring. Uh, the first is moon luminosity. Uh, at new moon and full moon, um, we tend to see more fish. And Moon luminosity is, is related to tide and, and, and water levels, so that's probably also driving that relationship. Next is ordinal day. Ordinal day, um, 
but it's highly correlated with water temperature, so we had to pick one when we put, uh, included it in our model, so we ran them independently. Ordinal Day gave us a little bit uh, more deviance explained, so that tells me that it's probably capturing some other variability that water temperature is now. Uh, third is the difference in the main stem Hudson water temperature and Black Creek water temperatures. This is something I wasn't initially looking at. Uh, it just We had the data available, so I threw it at the model. Uh, I liked it. So the, and it kind of makes sense, because Black Creek tends to warm up quicker in the spring. <coughs> uh, the main stem source might be providing a cue for the, for the river here in the, the airway climate. Uh, last was turbidity. Turbidity was a measurement taken from the main stem that needs further investigation. I'm, I don't like this at all. So in uh, 2017 and 2018, we uh, collaborated with Cornell University and, and graduate student David Wallach. I'm not going to get into the details of all this thesis, but I'm going to hit on through the highlights. Um, so Dave developed an, uh, a method for collecting river herring using egg mats. Egg mats have been around for a long time for, to capture eggs, but they haven't really been used for river herring. Um, I think he design is very uh, similar to one that's used for uh, lake trout. It's very simple. It's two furnace filters. Um, you can buy them at Home Depot, attached to a weighted PVC frame. We placed these randomly throughout the, the creek. We, then we took a random subsample from each mat. Then we, then we counted the, the eggs and larvae. Um, and then we extrapolated that back out to the entire bottom area of Black Creek. Next, Dave updated some kind of the estimates. He did it for both species. I'm only going to talk about other lives today. Uh, it's a very straightforward uh, fecundity estimate. Um, where we took uh, three subsamples of the left of very low, uh, then weighed each subsample, uh, took an image using image J software, we auto enumerated, and then we uh, extrapolated that back out to the over weight. Uh, but we ended up with just over 121,000 eggs uh, standardized to a wet weight of 220, just over 229 grams. So the whole point of this was to see if we could find a relationship between the eggs being inputted in Black Creek and eggs uh, that are being laid, the outputs. Um, so we have the number of fish from the counter times the fecundity uh, that should give us our outputs. So then we have the eggs you know, that we collect on the mats, we extrapolate out to the area of Black Creek, we get our outputs, they should equal each other. It'll be close enough to where we feel comfortable sleeping together. But they don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> So we were so good that we got more eggs being laid than that it could be possibly being in. <laughs> there's a couple of uh, theories I have as, as to why, and it could be our extrapolation method. We're assuming that each, uh, that a river herring egg has equal probability of being distributed or deposited anywhere in the entire bottom area of Black Creek. This isn't probably true, it's probably driven by hydrology. So I wanna go back and look at the data some more and see if we can tease that out. Um, the other thing that could be driving this discrepancy is our fecundity estimates. There's been some recent work done uh, that uh, suggests river herring are uh, indeterminate spawners, meaning they're continually developing new eggs throughout their, their spawning run. Um, and in that paper, the authors also, also <coughs> hypothesized that we could be underestimating fecundity by uh, three times. So that could also be a reason for uh, our discrepancy. So this coming field season, we're hoping to replicate what Dave did. So we're gonna, with some uh, yes. few changes, we're gonna redeploy the egg mats and, and use a, another fecundity estimate and incorporate some histological analysis to try to get at the, the number of batches and number of eggs being produced. So in summary, uh, an in-stream application uh, of a fish counter is a great tool to quantify river herring runs, uh, although it's very, very labor intensive. Um, <coughs> like I said, we hope to do continue to develop a new method uh, to simply use egg mats in lieu of, of counters to get at run estimates. Uh, so that's, that would, that's the, that's the end, end goal. And all this information uh, that we've really learned will help us uh, help fisheries managers develop fisheries management plans as well as uh, regulators uh, mitigate any kind of any potential threats during 